G'day there guys, Marky here, and welcome back to another episode of r slash relationship advice. Let's do it. Am I the a-hole for skipping my stepdaughter's wedding? I, 50 female, have two stepchildren, Sarah, 23 female, and Mike, 28 male. I have been in their lives since Sarah was two. Sarah's mum, Kate, was a drug addict, and when Sarah was three, she lost all her parental rights because of her addiction. Kate left after that and didn't have any contact until Sarah was 17. That's when Kate reached out to us saying that she was clean and wanted a relationship with the kids. My husband Rob was against this, but I wanted to give her a chance. We met with her, and it turns out that she had been clean for a while, was going to therapy, and had a decent job. Mike was against meeting her, and to this day insists I'm his only mom and that Kate is dead to him. Sarah was more open to Kate and resented Mike for rejecting her. I explained that Mike was older and witnessed Kate at her worst, so he has a different relationship with her, while Sarah only remembers her after getting clean. This issue still caused a lot of resentment between them and me. Kate blamed me for Mike being hostile and resented me. It didn't help that Sarah started rejecting me for Kate. She stopped spending time with me no matter what I did and stopped calling me mum. I told her how hurt I was, how she didn't have to choose, she could have us both. I never had an issue with Sarah and Kate, I only had an issue with being rejected. Sarah told me that while she appreciated me at the end of the day, Kate was her and Mike's real mum. This crushed me. The final straw was when she didn't invite me to her high school graduation. I told her if she didn't want to be my daughter, then fine. From then on, she would be my husband's kid. Mike is no contact with her as well. Three months ago, she came over with her fiancé, who we didn't even know existed, to invite us to their wedding. She said she wanted me at the bridal party, but I refused. I told her that we hadn't had a relationship in years because of her wishes, and it felt uncomfortable for me to take on that role when I barely knew her now. She said she was sorry. I told her I wasn't interested. She got angry and said that I had to be there because, and I quote, what are people going to think when both my brother and my dad's wife aren't there? Gramps, paternal grandfather, is going to get pissed off too. I told her that she clearly didn't want me there and only cared about appearances and being on her Gramps' good side as he's rich. I am not coming, nor am I having a relationship with her. She started crying and begging for forgiveness, but it felt like crocodile tears to me. After she left, she kept texting me trying to get me to change my mind. On the day of the wedding, she texted that she was going to leave an empty seat for me and that I was welcome any time if I changed my mind, but I still did not go. Rob is mad at me, saying I ruined his daughter's wedding and made her cry, that all she wanted was me there and this was a chance to fix our family. Mike, who is also no contact with her, is on my side. OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the a-hole. I think I might be the a-hole for not giving her a chance, but at the same time, I'm not sure what kind of relationship we can even have, nor am I sure if she was even genuine or not. In the comments, not the a-hole. She dropped you quickly enough for her real mum. You know, the one that did literally nothing for the hardest part of her life and then strolled in when it was convenient. She threw away 15 plus years of care like it was nothing. You can't reverse that at a drop of a hat to a full seat at a wedding. Husband is the a-hole for not seeing that she kicked you to the curb without a thought and expects you to be okay with it, although I can see that he is in a difficult position. OP replies, he is in a difficult position. Both of his kids are not talking to each other, and he was also started to be rejected by Sarah in favor of her stepdad. With Kate and her husband, she has it easier since there is no resentment there, but with her dad, she also has to face me and her brother. So it's easier for her to spend more time with her mum's side of the family. That is all very difficult, and I'm sorry for the position that you're all in. I'm surprised though that she can't see the position of her brother and her dad. She would be too young to remember her bio mom at her worst, but the others obviously can. It's great she can forgive and move on, but that doesn't remove the past and doesn't change how much you personally have done by stepping up to be her mother. OP replies, I tried to explain to her that Mike simply has a different relationship, but she doesn't accept that. Sorry to say, but she sounds quite self-centered. Hopefully she'll come around, 
but it's going to have to start with her offering a massive apology to all of you, and to you in particular. Not the a-hole. Once again, a wedding is not the place to fix families. She had years to do this, but it's only come up now because she wants to look good in front of relatives. You were not wrong to reject the invitation. It was given with an ulterior motive that was nothing to do with fixing anything. Not the a-hole. You were the one to give the first push in getting Rob to allow Kate to see them. Sarah basically slapped you in the face for everything you did. You even told Sarah that you were fine with being just a motherly figure, but she took it further by resenting you? Rob has some audacity to say that you ruined the wedding when you were the one who helped bring up these children then not get any support while you were blamed for Mike's choices and rejected. Did Kate go to Sarah's wedding? OP replies, she and her entire family were invited, and she was also in the bridal party as maid of honor. And now, on to the update. So, I would like to clarify a few things. Sarah's relationship with Mike is no contact because she couldn't accept his decision to cut Kate off. At first, Mike didn't support Sarah and Kate, but I sat them both down. I told them that both of them have very different relationships with Kate. Mike remembers Kate as an addict, while Sarah only remembers clean Kate, and both of them are entitled to their view of Kate. Mike accepted this and was okay with Sarah and Kate, but Sarah couldn't accept it. She couldn't reconcile addict Kate with clean Kate, so she refused to believe Mike and downplayed a lot of this trauma. Sarah said things like, It wasn't that bad. It was not her fault. She was sick. She gave you life. You owe her. Etc. And by the time Sarah was 19, their relationship became and is no contact. Kate also couldn't accept this and blamed me for Mike not wanting to talk to her. Regarding the wedding, Sarah reached out to me three months before the wedding, even though they had been engaged for a year, saying that they wanted to come over. We said yes, and she came with her fiancé, who we didn't even know existed. Apparently, they had been together for three years. When I say she apologized, I meant she said, I'm sorry you feel that way, which to her was an apology, but to me it's not. She also referred to me as dad's wife, as in, what would people say if my dad's wife isn't there? Not even stepmom. Dad's wife. She also mentioned her paternal grandfather a lot and how angry he would be. In the two months leading up to the wedding, she texted me to change my mind, but all she talked about was, the wedding will be ruined, grandpa will be mad, etc. Once the wedding happened, she blocked me everywhere. I found out today that her fiancé blocked me too, even though I don't follow him. I only messaged him on Instagram because he has a public profile, but I have been blocked. Same thing with Facebook, even though we aren't friends on there. She clearly wasn't genuine in her attempts to reconcile, and even if she was, it doesn't mean that I'm obligated to respond. She was 18 when she stopped calling me mum, 19 when she went no contact with Mike, and doubled down on her decision. A decision she has held on to for six years total. She made her choice. Just because she's young doesn't make her entitled to forgiveness or a relationship with me. And in the comments... The last paragraph was the exclamation point to this whole mess. I stand on the fact that she only wanted you there for appearances. She sounds young, entitled, and grossly immature. Good on you. Hold the line and stand your ground. Hopefully this does not cause issues in your marriage moving forward. She's old enough to know what she's doing and to be held responsible for her choices and actions. You respected her wishes and decisions. If she really wanted to make amends and apologize, she would or could have, but it's obvious she's turning into a not-so-nice and genuine person. In my opinion, you've done more than enough. You don't need to drag yourself through all the drama anymore. You're just dad's wife, right? What could she want from you? OP was right not to go. Her husband telling OP that she ruined the wedding needs to rethink who raised his kids and where he went wrong as the dad. OP never kept bio mom from her and raised her for 15 years. Sarah goes no contact and bio mom is the best. But you need to show up so Pop Pop isn't pissed at the bride so she can stay in the will. Someone cuts you out of their life for 6 years and expects you to play nice for grandparents' money can just F off. OP and Mike at least see the truth that Sarah is a brat. 
Our next post is titled, I am legally the father of a child who isn't mine, and the mother just passed away. I got married when I was 18 to a woman. We decided to split up a little over two years later because I realized I was gay. I moved to California, and she moved around as well, but apparently settled in North Carolina. No, I don't have some compelling reason to why we didn't file for divorce or even a formal separation. It just never seemed like a priority, and over the years was easy to forget. We weren't exactly calling each other all the time or ever. In fact, I haven't spoken to her since the day that I moved to California over 17 years ago. In that time, she had a child who is now 14 years old. My spouse recently passed away. I didn't think about this at the time, but since I was still married to her, I am legally the father of her child. I'm on the birth certificate, as was required by law at the time. Now, there is the issue of the fact that I'm now the surviving spouse, but more urgently, the sole legal parent of what is emotionally and biologically a random teenager. The estate is an issue too, but less so than an entire person. One of her mother's friends is willing to take in the child, but she is afraid that if I contest paternity, she wouldn't be approved by social services as a foster parent, and the child would have to face foster care, so she wants me to just give her temporary guardianship to run out the clock. I don't know anything about how any of that or contesting paternity would work. I know that foster care isn't exactly good for older kids, and I don't want to ruin this kid's life if there is another option but more informal arrangements don't seem like a good idea either. I don't want some random kid living with me, nor do I think that she would want that either. What do I do? Edit, of course her child is the proper sole heir slash inheritor of her mother's estate, and I will fix that as well when it is possible. And edit two, we do not know who the bio father is, and he is not involved. In the comments, not a lawyer. Who's caring for the child right now? Technically, you're responsible for providing food, clothing, and shelter. Are you sure that she's getting that? If she's not, it'll be on you that you are not providing it, and that is definitely a way to get the state involved, which it sounds like you do not want. What about health insurance? Again, if you do not want the state involved, that would have to be addressed. How well do you know the person that you would be giving guardianship to? Can the person be completely trusted? If she does become legal guardian, she will have control over assets the child receives after the will goes through probate. She would also have control over the assets the child would receive from your estate if you were to pass away. People sometimes get strange when it comes to money. OP says, I don't really know this person. She was at the hospital and the kid obviously trusted her enough to vouch for her there and request to go home with her. The friend knew of me enough to give them my contact info and tell them who I was. Quote, who is caring for the child right now? She is staying at her mother's house with a friend right now. Not sure of the exact situation though. I will ask that today. Healthcare. I haven't considered that one. I could add her to mine. Does that work in different states? And can the person be completely trusted? To my understanding, I'm already joint co-owner of most of the assets. I'll have to wait to see how it fully shakes out, but I should be able to just sit on it for four years to make sure the kid actually gets everything. I'm starting to think that I should talk to the kid directly to see what they think. I've been trying to avoid that because it seemed really creepy, but it's probably not avoidable. Guardianship should probably be acceptable rather than adoption, but you guys really need to talk to a family lawyer in order to find out all the rights that need to be assigned and what, if any, responsibility you would still have as the quote-unquote father in a guardianship situation. Adoption mostly benefits you by completely ending your legal involvement, but does not sound like it would be good for the child. You say the friend has a controversial career. Does she have a criminal history? If she has enough of a criminal background, the court might refuse to grant her guardianship. In general though, if you, as the current holder of the legal rights, approve of her, that can fast track the guardianship assignment and allow her to skip some of the more detailed examination where the court might complain about whatever she's up to. She needs to talk to a family lawyer and figure out what is involved in applying for guardianship. As best as I understand it, she will need to fill out an application with the court, and then a hearing will be scheduled to go over the situation. I have no idea if you would need to show up for that, or if you could issue a sworn statement, but I think being present would help. 
If it seems pretty straightforward to the court that you've got everything settled, they would probably rather just sign it over and not have to spend any more time and money investigating the situation where they are not wanted. OP says, We have an appointment with a lawyer there on Monday to ask these questions and have more than a cursory review. You keep saying we, so I assume you're talking about yourself and the friend. The issue is you don't really know the intentions of this friend, and the lawyer can't represent both of your interests in a situation that could potentially be adversarial. You really need your own attorney that is looking out for your interests first. There are other liabilities here to consider as well. If you are now the co-owner of the property, you are responsible and liable for what happens there, just like any other property that you might own. You'll need insurance and a proper rental agreement if you are going to allow the friend to live there to take care of the child. That's just the first thing I thought of, but there are certainly others. That is why you need your own attorney. And OP says, That's definitely giving me a lot to think about. I was really hoping I could just work with the friend. It seems really presumptuous to just sidestep the only adult that I know this child knows and act like I alone know best despite knowing nothing and being a total stranger. Just one with paperwork that backs me. Well, don't look at it as sidestepping. Making sure your ducks are in a row is not a slight to this friend. It's making sure things are done correctly for everybody involved. And now on to the update. It's been an eventful few months, but things have settled down now for the most part. Things have happened. It's nothing super exciting or dramatic, but here's the news. I've met the mother's friend and the daughter. We talked it over in exhausting detail and went over absolutely everything that we and our lawyers, as she also engaged with one as well, could think of. We decided that it was best that I stay as the legal father. The mother's friend was adamant that she only wanted power of attorney and nothing more, which the lawyers approved. SSI is put in a shared account that only I and the child are joint on. She has access to the bank card. The child is enrolled in school, and I was able to get her on my insurance, even though it's going to be more expensive due to her seeing doctors out of state, technically. The condo has been sold, and that money has been added to her 529, which we hope will cover her for college. I have been working with my lawyer and a financial advisor on how to handle the finances, and we have a game plan for how to save as much of the estate for the child as possible, which mostly means that her mother's personal funds are in various savings accounts that I'll transfer to her when she is 21 or she graduates college. On a personal level, though, we have obviously exchanged numbers and stay in contact. The mother's friend is insisting on legal distance for herself due to some personal things that she doesn't want to affect the child. It is a weird situation, but the child feels safe with her, and I would also judge it as safe. We are not planning on her coming to live with me or any kind of instant father thing, but she's coming to visit for Christmas and may visit for some of the summer if that goes well. In the comments, This could have gone wrong 100 different ways, but it didn't. The child has experienced the loss of her mother, but it seems like she's in good hands. I commend OP, as it seems he wants to make sure the child is set up for success. I also think that it's really nice that she's going to visit for summer and holidays. She must trust him and feel a connection, and he probably does too. I wish them all well. It's really sweet that the guy realizes, despite him having no connection to this kid, except legal paperwork, he is being friendly and compassionate about the kid's situation. Older kids in foster care do suffer. They're often used for free labor work, especially on farms. Or, much worse, with the only escape being thrown back into the system, then rolling the dice again till you age out. Yep, I worked with street kids for a while, and they were just trying to stay out of the system because it had been nothing but bad experiences. I really hate that North Carolina does this. My parents were mid-divorce when my mum had a baby, the state tried to go after my dad for child support, it was easy to disprove since they hadn't been in the same state together for years, but it was a hassle. I imagine if my dad couldn't afford a lawyer, he would have been in a bad place. It is so bizarre that the state would automatically put someone not biologically related to a child as a parent on their birth certificate without that person's consent. 
It's coming from the logic that a child should have all legally connected persons be financially responsible for it in order to keep as many people as possible off state welfare. So that leads to people who aren't the parents of that child, but have something like a paper-only marriage, being obligated to provide. And that's where I'm going to end today's episode, guys. I do hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.